So let's look at another example of the matrix of derivatives, something where it's a little bit less of a familiar kind of function. And again, this is something where we'd really want to go into a lot more depth, and I have more videos about more depth about uh, how to understand a function like this one, for example, with three inputs and two outputs. Um, but there's a there's a fairly uh, ordinary kind of setting where, where we can think about this, and I, I want to put it in that setting. So let's say we have an explicit function g of x, y, and z, and notice I'm I'm starting to write that very explicitly as a column vector. Be really really careful about putting um, all vectors as column vectors uh, to emphasize how the dimensionality works. Um, and it's going to be x squared plus 2y squared plus 3z squared for the first coordinate of the point in R2 that we're, we're calculating. That's the f function we had in example 1. And then a new one, 4x squared minus y squared minus z squared is the second coordinate. So a really a, a good way to think about that in a lot of ways is as a transformation that takes a point in three-dimensional space and creates a point in the plane in a nonlinear fashion, which may be a little more, uh, a bit of a generalization of what you might have seen with um, linear transformations. But another way to think about it, which isn't quite as intimidating uh, geometrically, I think, is simply that it's two one variable functions or two real variable, real valued functions of three variables just put together for convenience in this, in a package. And that's often what happens when you're thinking about vectors is it's just two numbers put together in a convenient package. Not the most sophisticated or geometric way to think about it, but not a horrible way. And so, for example, these aren't terribly realistic for this this kind of thing physically, but let's say this is the pressure, the barometric pressure or something at some point in three-dimensional space, and this is the temperature. Uh, and so, for example, we could under, start to understand this function, which is a lot of information, but we could understand this function a little better by just focusing on its separate outputs, those are just one variable functions of three variables, and then thinking about the level sets of that. So we already drew a level set of the pressure function, for example, um, an ellipsoid, and then the temperature, if you set that equal to a constant, it's going to be a hyperboloid. If you set it equal to a positive constant, for example, it'll be a hyperboloid of two sheets, because it's got two minus signs. And I did a pretty poor attempt at doing one of the sheets of that, so that's just kind of a bowl, should be thought of as a bowl facing outward in the x direction. Uh, if you want a better picture, let me go to calcplot 3D. So there's the ellipsoid, and then I'm going to add in the um, the hyperboloid. And one interesting thing, and this is going to be the subject of uh, another video, but I've, well, it's already, I've already made it, um, and that is that when we look at a level set of the entire function, when we say what would happen if g of x, y, z goes to the point 1, 1. I picked 1 here for both. Um, let me go back to my... What happens if you set this function equal to 1, 1? You set p equal to 1 and t equal to 1. Then you're getting the intersection of these two surfaces. So a really good motivation for thinking about a function with three inputs and two outputs is if you have two surfaces, maybe two constraint surfaces in a Lagrange multiplier problem, perhaps, um, then you're interested in the intersection of those surfaces. And you can think of it as, as this curve of intersection here as the level set of a function that goes from R3 to R2. So that's the intersecting surfaces and transversality video. If I remember, I'll try and put a link up. Um, so let's just look at the matrix of derivatives of this. And then I'm going to uh, do a little chain rule example by combining this with example 2. OK, so we know the, the derivatives of the, for the top one, 2x, 4y, and 6z. So again, we're just taking the derivative of each of the outputs, and that's in the rows, as always, uh, with respect to each of the inputs, and the different uh, input variables are the columns. So now we're going to take the derivative of the t function, the second output of g, with respect to x, so 8x minus 2y and uh, minus 2z. Okay. So for example, dg, um, well, let me... Let me combine this. Let's suppose we have, are monitoring the pressure and the temperature of a particle given by R of t, which was doing that helix before, 5t, uh, where was it? 5t cosine 2t and sine 2t. So we have a particle kind of doing a helix 
through here and as it goes is experiencing different pressure and different temperature and we'd like to figure out how the pressure and temperature vary as functions of time well that's exactly taking this function and composing it with the r function so we've got t living in r creates x y z living in r3 and then we register the pressure and temperature and collate them together as one object in r2 and we're looking at the composed function. So the chain rule expressed in terms of matrix of derivatives is just very, very beautiful. D of the composed function, pressure and temperature of location as function of time is just DG, that matrix times DR. Now we have to put the T directly into here and then, of course, we're going to have to evaluate this at the appropriate x, y, z of t. And I'll demonstrate that very explicitly. So, for example, we already know, ooh, I don't want to erase any of that. I think I can get away with erasing this stuff. Uh, we know that, um, that r, oh, yeah, that dr, I don't have the derivative yet, at time pi was equal to 5, 0, 2 from the previous video, okay? And then dg at, ooh, I have to know what the location is. Okay, so r of pi, can we see that? Just barely, yeah. Okay, ooh, I'm not gonna be able to fit it in. Um, let's see, I'll put it right, right up here. The location at time pi, as always for the chain rule, you have gotta figure out what the values of your intermediate variables are at the specified value of your original variables to get it all correct. And r of pi, that is going to be 5 pi uh, 1, 0. Okay, yep. Okay. And so dg at 5 pi 1, 0. So I need to evaluate this guy. Okay. So the z's are going to die. Okay. Um, 2x is going to be 10 pi. 4y is just going to be 4, and 40 pi, and minus 2. Okay. And now we're just going to multiply these two matrices. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think I can get away with erasing this stuff. So this is just going to be the product of these two matrices. What do we expect to get? It has one input and two outputs, so it should just be a little uh, two component column vector and 10 pi 4 0 matched with 5 0 2 not much survives it's just going to be 50 pi and then 40 pi minus 2 0 matched with 5 0 2 is not going to not much survives there either 200 pi and that is one way to calculate um, this is simply um, p prime of t just it's actually an ordinary derivative of these two functions and collating them together and so that's a um, the change it gives you the change of both these output quantities of the function g that calculate the pressure and temperature as a function of time and it comes very very nicely from these two matrices and you simply multiply the matrices so that's good for now